Okay, so the class and the discussion tonight is really about evil. Um, as you can see, why evil exists, but we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of evil as a just bad things happening or tragedies. We're not going to talk about that uh, type of evil tonight, even though it, we could, and the topic is is somewhat re uh, relevant, but I I want to try to to now to to have some tunnel vision and narrow our focus to a certain element within evil and that is hatred so let's talk about hatred for a minute uh, or hate um we're also even within hate we're going to choose a very specific type of hate to to, fo to focus our discussion on so if, so if, let's say you know there's somebody who who does something bad to us and we hate them. So that's not the hate we're talking about. Or if there's somebody who annoys us or, you know, rubs us the wrong way. Um, I'm not justifying the hate, still very bad hate, but that's still not, but that's not the hate we're talking about. Um, if there's a hatred in terms of, of um, jealousy or, or, um, or someone who's, who's always trying to, um, undermine us. Once again, that's not the hate we're, we're talking about. The hatred we're going to focus on is specifically the idea that your existence is a threat to me, and therefore I hate you. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you say, what you do, um, or how you act. Zero. It's just the fact that your existence is a threat to me or a threat to what I stand for and therefore i i hate you that's the type of hate we're, we're gonna we're gonna dive into um and why are we doing this is because in the parsha we have the famous uh mitzvah and we actually read this before um we read this before purim uh as to fulfill the mitzvah to fulfill the mitzvah although we're going to read it on this week's parsha as we go through the torah and it's the famous remember to forget so the first pasuk of Yud Zayin says that we have to remember what Amalek did to us right after we left Egypt. Um, and then what's the mitzvah? The mitzvah is not just to remember, but to erase the memory of Amalek. So this this idea has been talked about and and debated, you know, throughout Jewish history and throughout the Torah as well. Uh, throughout the commentaries, because it's very contradictory. It's one thing to say, remember what they did to you, and destroy them, right? Remember that Amalek started up with you after you left Egypt, so remember how bad they were. So then, destroy them. That one makes sense. Because your job is to remember that these people are out to get you, and therefore you have to take action against them. But that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says, look in the uh, look in Pasuk Yutas in verse 19, it says, and by the way, when the Torah reader reads it, the Torah reader says to ensure that we include all corporations of memory. So it's not that destroy a malik, destroy the memory of a malik. So it's basically it's it's a total contradiction to the idea of remembering a malik if we're trying to erase the memory of a malik. It's a total contradiction. So that's that's the puzzling part of the parish that we want to talk about that's going to lead us to our discussion. Before we go further, um, I want to expand a little bit uh, upon the um, the goal of tonight's class, the goal of the discussion tonight. We're, we're trying to understand how to explain and justify when there's the existence of something that we that we cannot comprehend, that it's so bad that we can't comprehend. Once again, I'm not trying to go into that why bad things happen. I don't want to touch that tonight. Um, I'm, I'm just alluding to it a little bit um, in terms of hatred. But when something is so bad that we just can't figure it out, and I want to use one type of hatred that, that we're all familiar with, um, but at the same time, keep in mind that this is not just about anti-Semitism, because that's the type of hatred I'm going to use for this discussion. But this any type of hatred that, that could be compared to this um, to this hatred. Which what which what's the problem? What's so difficult about anti-Semitism for many for many of us to to comprehend? It's 
It's one thing, oh, these are bad people and they hate us, fine. But then when you start looking into the reasoning of why they hate us, it never makes sense. Like, for example, the Nazis would say, oh, we hate the Jews because they, they're trying to take over the world or they control the world or they run the banks or they have so much money or whatever. Well, they didn't just go after the rich Jews. They didn't just go after the influential. They went after all the Jews. Uh, if you say that they hate the Jews because of the, the way they observe the way they observe Torah and mitzvot or the way they behave, well, they didn't just go after observant Jews. In fact, they went after Jews who converted to Christianity. They went after those Jews too. So... The, the and now in today's anti-Semitism, not just from the from the extreme right, where it's overt about the Jews, but there's the anti-Semitism that's more on the left that is about Israel or cloaking it in Israel. So we look at it, we try to explain it, we try to make sense, we try to argue, we try to debate, but it never gets us anywhere. And it's very, very frustrating. And it's very um um like mind-boggling. Like we, we don't even know how to identify it and how to combat it. And we're going to discuss that tonight, and we're going to use the story of Amalek to make sense of that of that uh, confusion that we usually have when we try to face anti-Semitism. So um, one of the commentaries tries to explain this mitzvah, that Hashem is commanding us to remember what Amalek did to us when he hurried to be the first to harm us. We are commanded to rouse our passions, to fight and hate him. We must always remember this commandment and never allow our hatred of Amalek to fade with time. So, so on a very simple level, um, after the Jewish people left Egypt, uh, miraculously, so the entire world, you know, heard about this, this. This made the news of the entire world, and the world was impressed. The world was impressed with God and the fact that the Jewish people were being led and protected by Hashem. And nobody, in fact, all the nations of Canaan started to tremble that here these people are coming to, and they knew they had no chance. The one nation that had the chutzpah or had the 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 gall the 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 lack of fear to attack the Jewish people was Amalek. And even though it says, as we're going to see, they even knew they're going to lose, but they still went ahead and attacked them and they still considered it a success. So that is what the Torah wants us to forget, wants us to remember to forget. So, so let's break this down a little bit. There's another mitzvah that uses the same word of Zecher, or similar word of Zecher, and that is Shabbos. The, in the Ten Commandments, which we read twice, both in Yisro and in Veschanan, in Yisro, the word, the commandment to keep Shabbos, the beginning is to, to honor, to, to remember, we, um, which which we translate as honor, but in literal terms, it's remember the Shabbos to make it holy. In Veschanan, the word is Shamar as Yom Shabbos, which means to guard the Shabbos, and it says that Hashem said these two words together, Zohar and Shamar, um, and said them at the same time, but they're both equally important. But let's focus on the Zohar, on the remembering of Shabbos. That's another mitzvah of things that we have to remember, is remembering the Shabbos. And interestingly, there's a very interesting medrash that um, the Pirkei de Rabbi Lezer brings up, uh, which the Jewish, that says that the Jewish people complained um, that you can't ask us to remember Amalek and remember Shabbos. So this is a fascinating statement from uh, the Pirkei de Rabbi Lezer. Uh, Perkin Yarbel is one of my favorite uh, books to read. Uh, it's um, it's it's a book. Of, it's a medrash. It's a, a medrash, by the way, means any any um, any book that was written by one of the sages um, in the times of the Talmud and times of the Mishnah uh, as a commentary on on the Torah. Uh, not not necessarily not halacha. It was not focused on the halachic or practice. It was more focused on lessons and 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 things that happened and and understanding the the the, the stories of the Torah. Um, that's why it's called medrash, which means like drasha, like drush. It's 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 not a it's not a halachic study. It's a it's a lesson type of study. So the Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, he, uh, in his book, he writes: the Jewish people complained to Moshe, and they said, Moshe, one pasuk in the Torah tells us to remember what Amalek did to us. Another pasuk says, remember the Shabbos to sanctify it. How could both prevail? It's a very weird question and a hard one to understand. They don't ask Moshe how come it says to remember to for, and remember what Amalek did to you and then remember to forget, or, or sorry, erase the memory uh, of Amalek. Like they didn't bother asking that. They asked how could you tell us to remember Shabbos and remember Amalek? Those two don't go together, which we'll explain in a minute because it's the, the question is hard to understand. Uh, now, by the way, at the end of davening in the morning, so there's a um, there's there's a, a couple verses that we say 
uh, that is known as the uh, the shape the the, uh, the six things that we're supposed to remember. Um, those of us who put on Rabbeinu Tam's to fill in, so we actually read it during that time of of the Rabbeinu Tam. So there's known as the 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 six the six things to remember. Uh, they're not. It's not. That's not what's on the screen now. I'm going to mute everyone just to um, uh, just to um, um, avoid background noise. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, so basically, there are six things that we have to remember. But that's not. This is more of a of a general of how we're supposed to believe in Hashem. Number one, believe in Hashem. Number two is we have to reject all idol worship. Number three, we have to believe in Hashem's unity, the fact that everything is God, that everything in this world is united. There's no, there's nothing separate. There's no second power. There's no nothing else in this world that has any power. Uh, number four, we have to love Hashem. Number five, we have to fear and have that reverence of Hashem. And number, number six is we have to resist the temptations of our hearts and our eyes to follow our our, our lust and follow things that we shouldn't that we shouldn't, uh, which could disconnect us from Hashem. But there's another there's another six things that we have to remember which we're going to get to in a minute but i, I don't want to forget I, don't, I still want to make mention it which number one is is shabbos number two is amalek and number three is to remember uh what miriam what happened to miriam and we're going to those are the those are three and we're going to get to the next three soon so they're interested the idea of remembering is an interesting uh concept and the torah tells you to remember something and and we have to make sense of it a little bit so what did Moshe answer the Jewish people when they said we can't um we can't have both we can't remember our Malik and remember um Shabbos. So Moshe said, wait a second, you can't compare a goblet of fine wine to a a cup of vinegar. They're both cups, but this is a cup to observe and sanctify the Shabbos and this is a cup to destroy and uproot the descendants of a Malik. So both question and answer are very cryptic and almost impossible to understand. Um, first of all, what's the question? Why can't you do both? Why can't you? You remember what Amalek did to you. And number two, you remember the Shabbos and every seventh day of the week. Why are they, what's so hard? Why, what, what do they have to do with each other? And how does this answer even make sense? So here's what we're going to do. That's the vinegar. I don't know if that's vinegar. It looks like, looks like whiskey, but whatever. It looks like honey, actually. But anyways, honey, um, we're, we're going to use this as a way of understanding understanding hatred and understanding um, this this sense of evil that's in the world. So let's first understand the cups and the goblets. Let's get that out of the way. Is number one is there there is a commandment to remember the greatness of Shabbos that says that if we if we if we honor the Shabbos, we partner with Hashem in creation. You know it says that when you say Vayachulu. Um, together, we're, we're partnering with Hashem in the creation. How? Because we're sanctifying the Shabbos, we're recognizing that Hashem elevated the entire, created the entire world and elevated the entire world to be holy. Uh, and even though it doesn't always appear so, but we have to remember that Hashem is the creator and the constant creator. And that's how we become partners. So this is a commandment to remember the greatness of this day and to fix faith in the creation in our hearts. As the Torah states, remember the Shabbos to sanctify it. For Hashem made the world in six days, and rested on the seventh. So that's the core of this mitzvah. Um, why do we have to make kiddush on a, on a, a cup of wine? What's that? What, what does that have to do? Why can't we just dab it? We dab it in shul. We say baruchu. We sing the chadodi, uh, which yes, it wasn't only it wasn't it was invented in five hundred years ago, but still we we celebrate Shabbos. Why do we have to have a cup of wine? Why can't we just go straight to the hamotzi? It says we sanctify it over a cup of wine because it is human nature to be aroused by wine, as it satiates and it causes joy. And I've often explained that our inspiration is more is more permanent when we translate it into physical acts. Thus, our sages taught that those who prefer bread over wine should sanctify the Shabbos over bread, for we are each aroused by the things we crave. So this is very, very important. Usually when you do a mitzvah, the mitzvah has to be about what is required of the mitzvah. So, for example, if Hashem says, say the Shema in the morning, it's not about when we decide it's morning. It's the fact that the, the morning of hours, the first three hours of the day, that's the morning. That's what Hashem wants us to say the Shema. If we say the Shema at three in the morning before the sun rises, we didn't accomplish the mitzvah. It's about what Hashem wants from us. And we, and we talk about this a lot, is that a mitzvah is what makes a mitzvah holy, what makes a mitzvah special, is the fact that this is what Hashem asked us to do. And that's what makes it a mitzvah. And that's usually how it is by the mitzvahs. But this is different. 
with Shabbos, with this mitzvah, not with this mitzvah of sanctifying the Shabbos over a cup of wine, is to translate the mitzvah into our physical being, into our physical life. And this represents the Shabbos in a very important way. Because it's not about being holy and being in shul a whole day and davening a whole day and learning a whole day. It's about making every part of our life holy. So if when we go home and we um, make Kiddush on something that we actually enjoy, and that's why it's important to make an achala if you don't like wine, or making a grape juice at least, but basically something that you enjoy, because what you're doing is you're translating the holiness of the mitzvah into your physical desires. You're taking your physical desire and you're 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 elevating it to the holiness of Shabbos, and it becomes holy. And that's what Shabbos is to the world. It elevates the entire world, including all the materialism and all the negativity, into holiness. It's actually a custom. Um, it's it's a, not just a custom, but it's a it's a powerful tradition that if we can, if for health reasons, you know, it's not a problem, we should actually make kiddush on red wine on Friday night. If there's a kabbalistic power and reason to the red wine, uh, because it it elevates red wine is the um, it contains with, within it the secrets, the uh, the secrets of creation. Which everything in this world has a soul, but the the, the wine, red run, red wine represents the source uh, of the of the secrets of Hashem's energy that's powering the whole world. So when we make kiddush on red wine, we're tapping into that to that energy, into that holiness of showing how everything in this world is created by Hashem. So uh, that's why even if we're not the biggest fans of wine, we still make every effort to to make kiddush on wine. Obviously, if you can't uh, health reasons or you don't have wine. Or whatever it is, you're all, halakhically, you're allowed to make Kiddush on challah, as he says over here. But there's something special about doing it on wine because we're we're connecting the most materialistic drink um, that we could find and elevating it, elevating it into holiness. So now we can understand why the Jewish people were so concerned with the mitzvah of Zachar Asim Shabbos Lakashev, remembering the Shabbos, which is the sanctification of this of Kiddush with the, the mitzvah of remembering Amalek. Because once you say, you're telling us that we have to remember the Shabbos, which what does that mean? Elevating all materialism into holiness, and the whole world is a part of Hashem, and created by Hashem, and constantly being created by Hashem, and everything is an essence of Hashem. How could you tell us that there's something called Amalek that wants to hurt us, and is so evil that we have to destroy it? What a second, everything's part of Hashem. Where, how is there even room for Amalek? How is there room for such negativity? If the whole idea of remembering the Shabbos is to remind us how in creation of the six days, Hashem elevated the entire world and everything in it, and every single molecule that is created in the entire universe, that exists in the entire universe, is all part of the oneness of Hashem, and we, we, we live that on Shabbos, how could we have another mitzvah that reminds us to forget to remember to forget that there's an Amalek and there's a there's an evil entity that wants to destroy us. It's a contradiction. Sorry, let's go back to that um, slide over there. So Shabbos is meant to remind us that we are not the masters of our destiny. We are always in God's hands, and He alone is our constant creator. Problem is with Amalek, you're telling us that there's somebody else there that's trying to mess with that. This is just a continuation of the purpose of Shabbos that we remind ourselves that every, Hashem created everything, uh, that every single day, every single second, Hashem is keeping uh, everything in, in existence. If Hashem removed his energy or withdrew his energy from anything, it would cease to exist. It's not that it would be destroyed or burnt or whatever. It would cease to exist. It would be as if it never existed because Hashem's energy is what makes it exist. Okay, so the Rebbe explains... What is the the unique spirit of Amalek and why it's taking on such an interesting way mitzvah of remembering to forget, remembering Amalek, and why the Jewish people were so um were so concerned with that mitzvah in addition to the mitzvah of remembering Shabbos? So there's a there's a quote from the Madrash, the Sifra, where he says, Amalek has a different attitude. The whole different animal, different attitude. Our sages of blessed memory describe him as one who knows his master and deliberately rebels. So let's explain this for a minute. There was once a uh, um, a, a 
atheist who uh, came to the fifth Chabad Rebbe and he uh, um, tried to challenge him on the existence of God. And in the middle of their discussion, the Rebbe um, um, told him, you should know we, we're actually in agreement because the same God that you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. In other words, most people rebel against God, but they don't even know who God is. In their mind, they concocted this idea of what God should be, and then they don't, and then that's the God they don't believe in. It takes a lot, it takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of study uh, to really understand who is the creator. It says that Avram discovered his creator. There are some, there's an opinion that says he was 40 years old at the time. And if that's the case, what's so special about Avram? Whether we agree with that opinion or not, the fact that the Talmud quotes that opinion that he was 40 years old means the fact that he discovered his creator is a big deal regardless of what age you're at. So, so the idea of knowing who... Know, in fact, by the way, when somebody sins in today's time, we say that no matter, even if it was deliberate, it was really um, it was really a shogig. It was really a, 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 a innocent mistake because we have no idea what we're rebelling against. We have no idea what we're... Um, we, we don't see the impact. We don't see... Um, um, the, the the creation the way the sages did. So for us, it's much harder to 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 um, to value and to under, even understand what it is that we're supposed to believe in. It's, that's why we have to study it, and it's a lot, a lot of work. Amalek was one foe, was one element that actually understood who they were rebelling against. And the, in Hebrew, it's Yedeas Rebainai Umechavin Limeredbai. That he knew who the creator is, they knew who the creator is, and yet they still chose to rebel. Um, so the Rebbe continues, Amalek did not lack the knowledge of God. On the contrary, he knew and recognized God's greatness. And nevertheless, he refused, refused to be intimidated. His uh, impudence and, and audacity drove him to reject Hashem without reason or justification, like impudent people who know they are inferior yet stand up brazenly to powerful or righteous people. So they, unlike other people who would rebel against God or rebel against the Jewish people out of out of ego or out of uh, whatever reason was driving them, Amalek actually tried to rebel against Hashem, knowing who Hashem was and knowing who they were rebelling against. Um, like for example, if you have like a a criminal, right? So some criminals are are smarter where they know that there's <clears throat> there are certain establishments or there are certain people that they can't commit crimes against because those those entities are, are way too powerful for them and will eventually um, um, make them pay for it. Um, but there are some criminals who don't get it. They just do crime anywhere or everywhere. And the idea that that Amalek was willing to take Hashem on was, was, a, was a whole new attitude. Now we get to talk about anti-Semitism. Amalek is the descendant of Esav, right? Esav was Yaakov's twin, the son of Yitzchak. And Esav um, was, is the ancestor of Amalek. Amalek is the ancestor of Haman, who was the one who conspired to kill an entire Jewish nation in, the, in Persia during the 70-year exile, and that's the Purim story that we celebrate. Now, what is the, what is the source of both Amalek's attacking the Jewish people in, in the desert and, uh, and Haman's, uh, Haman's threat of, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, trying to annihilate the Jewish people in, um, in Persia and going on to the Nazis who wanted to destroy the Jewish people, period? What's really the attitude? What's really the, the cause behind it? So, in Hasidus, we learn that there, it's not necessarily a hatred of you of what you do. In fact, it's not at all. It's the fact that you represent that there's a God, and there's a God that is everything, including me, including every single thing, and there is a way to connect Tasha. The fact that you do that hurts me because your existence is a reminder of what I need to be doing too. I'm going to try to um, unpack that a little bit because this is this is very important. And, and I want to start with a story. Um, there was a chassid. Um, his last name was Marazov. 
And he was a teacher in one of the underground yeshivas, one of the underground Jewish schools during the communists um, in uh, uh, revolution in, um, in Russia. And at the time, any sort of Jewish education or any sort of Jewish practice was punishable by death, was considered counter-revolutionary. They would take them to the wall and they would shoot them without question. Uh, they, they murdered millions and millions of people, amongst them millions of Jews as well. Um, many Jews were sent to Siberia for many years. Um, and this is when the previous Rebbe um, had, had his Hasidim promise him that they're going to do everything they can um, with mysterious nefesh, with self-sacrifice, to keep Judaism alive in the Soviet Union. So this Marazov was a, uh, a underground te underground teacher, uh, and when he was caught, so they took him and his friend to uh, the wall, and they said, "Today we're going to kill one." They would play games with them. Today we're shooting one of you. And they took the they took Marazov and they put him in, against the wall, and they told him, and this is his, his friend is the one who told the, who told the story. They said, we're at war with God. We can't kill God. We don't know how to kill God. But you're the closest thing we could find. And then they shot him. In a way, it's a hard story to tell. It's a hard story to hear, I'm sure. But in a way, that personifies the hatred that we're talking about. It's not a hatred of what you've done. It's not a hatred of who you are. It's not a hatred of, of anything. Sorry, it's not a hatred of how you look or how you act or any of that. It's the fact that you represent something that we can't stand. You represent godliness. You represent the idea that you could bring godliness into the world and everything is godly and everything is holy. And everything can be sanctified. Even red wine could be made holy. You represent that. And we don't like that. Because we want to enjoy our red wine the way it is without having to think about God. So the fact that you introduce this idea that everything is God and everything could become holy is a threat to our existence. So let's read it inside. Amalek and Haman are targeting the Jews less as a people than as a divine people. Therefore, their war is directed mainly against God of Israel. They object to his Torah. They are uncomfortable with God who sees everything and demands and accounting for wrongdoing. These things are not to the Amalekites liking. They don't want them. They therefore wish to destroy the Jewish people who stand for perfect faith in Hashem of Israel this is why Hashem's name and throne cannot be complete as long as Amalek exists. Consequently, we must never forget what Amalek did to us and what he continues to do. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna be a little um, uh, politically incorrect over here, and I, I might sound harsh, and I totally understand if you want to um, take a break. But this principle goes beyond just Haman and Amalek, and, and also goes beyond the Nazis. This principle is something that affects human society in general. One of the reasons why the Christians were so upset with the Jewish people and so obsessed with trying to get Jews to convert to Christianity was because the fact that Jewish people were still living the Torah the way they were was a threat to their belief. Their belief was we don't have to do any of that anymore because all you have to do is accept this individual, and then you are you are immediately brought into that um, into into that faith, and there's nothing you have to do. You're free as long as you have a good heart. You're good, or at least some would say that. I'm not talking about the whole religion as a whole. There are many many good Christian people. Uh, there are many people who live great Christian values and are are very very decent um, and and great people. I'm talking about in the medieval times when there was an obsession to convert Jews to, to Christianity is because they were a threat to their existence. But I'm going to take this a step further. In the Jewish community itself, there's an obsession sometimes among certain groups of, of certain groups in the, uh, of, of the Jewish community where they feel threatened by Jews who are more observant than them. Because those Jews remind them that there's more that they should be doing. I'm not talking. I'm not singling out any specific group. I'm singling out. I am mentioning the fact that it happens, um, and it's visible that when we see someone who, when we see someone who's more religious than us or more careful than us, it kind of bothers us because they're basically reminding us that there's more, there's more we could be doing or should be doing. 
Um, so it's important to remember that this is not something that we're immune to. Just because we're not a Malik or Haman or a Nazi, God forbid, this is a kind of hatred that, that could affect every single human being. Every human being is susceptible to this because the moment somebody um, or someone reminds us of the fact that God is one and that we could live a life of, uh, or we should be living a life of bringing godliness into everything. Uh, and we don't want to, sometimes don't want to do that. We want to have fun and enjoy ourselves. Um, it, it could bring about this kind of hatred that we're talking about, not to the point that we would do anything about it, God forbid, but it's a, it's a, it's a possibility. So it's something we have to always think about and always be aware of. And that's why we're learning about it. And that's why the Torah tells us, remember Amalek. Because it's not just the Amalek, the, the, the anti-Semites or the people, the e most evil people that are, that are, those are easy to remember, to remember to hate. Anyone forget the Nazis? No. But remember the, 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 the hatred of Amalek that has the chutzpah to rebel against God, even though you know, there, you know there's a God. And you understand the value of God. And you understand the value of connecting everything with Hashem. And the value of Torah and mitzvahs involved in materialism. Remember that Amalek is going to try to pull you away from that and make you hate that because it means that you have to give up your, you have to, you have to sacrifice. You have to give up some of your planet. You have to give up the, the enjoyment of it sometimes. And you have to dedicate it to a, whole, to a higher cause. You have to always remember that. And this is a reminder to all of us. So now let's now that we understand the question of why the Jewish people were saying how could we honor Shabbos or remember the Shabbos as well as remembering Amalek, and so now that we understand that because Shabbos represents godliness united without all materialism, and um, Amalek represents a rebellion against God and the fact that there's a, another existence or it feels like there's another existence that's against God. How is that possible if God is everything? So now we have to look at Moshe's answer. Moshe said that you can't compare vinegar to wine. So what is vinegar? Vinegar is wine. It's just wine that went bad. And this actually brings a source from uh, a scientific source that tells us how wine turns to vinegar. I'm not going to read it, but basically it's pretty clear that if wine isn't taken care of or it's not stored in the right way or whatever happens, it can turn into vinegar. And we all know that vinegar, if you drink it the way it is, tastes terrible. You can use vinegar. For positive things, though, you can't drink it or you shouldn't drink it, but there are things you could use vinegar for. For example, vinegar is great in salad dressing or vinegar could be great within a framework or within context. Vinegar could be a very powerful tool, as we're going to see right over here. Uh, vinegar, I'll come back to this text in a second. Sorry. Vinegar, the vinegar could restore the soul that sometimes if someone faints, so if you put some vinegar, it could so powerful and strong, it could bring someone back to uh, consciousness. So vinegar has a, has a use. Not only that does it have a use, but it actually originates from wine. So what was Moshe's answer when he says, um, you can't compare a glass, a goblet of fine wine with, with, um, with vinegar? What was he trying to say? So the Rebbe explains. When we examine the concept of Amalek from a perspective of Jewish mysticism, from, from, from Hasidus, from Kabbalah, we discover that Amalek, represent, represented by vinegar, is also rooted in holiness. Just like vinegar originates from wine, Amalek and evil and hatred and all these bad things originate, are created by God. So how does, why, how and why does God allow Amalek with such hatred, such baseless hatred to exist when Amalek, it says, knows his creator and still wants to rebel against his creator, why would Hashem allow that to exist? And that's the second paragraph. How can anything deliberately rebel against God if there's none beside him? If Hashem is everything and if Hashem created everything, and the whole reason why we make Kiddush on wine on Shabbos is to, is to demonstrate how even the wine could become holy is a part of creation, and a part of God's continuous creation of the world and all materialism. And our job is to constantly reveal the godliness and everything in materialism. So how could there be anything in the world that will deliberately rebel against God if there's nothing but Hashem? So how is that possible? So the answer, and this is a this is this is a tough answer. So we gotta you gotta concentrate here, but the answer is that by allowing the possibility of rebellion 
Hashem is actually demonstrating the, His greatness even more so. By allowing materialism and allowing our physical world and the creation of the world to feel independent and appear independent, giving us free choice, which would also allow the possibility of a rebellion, especially the rebellion of Amalek, which knows there is a creator, believes in God, and yet still wants to rebel against God, and therefore attack the Jews right after they left Egypt, and with Haman tried to destroy the entire Jewish nation in Persia, and so on. How is that possible? Because even when there is a rebellious force, it still cannot be sustained. And it will still eventually dissipate and be overcome. And that demonstrates the power of Hashem's creation even more so. So let's 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 take a step further here. So it's one thing to say Hashem is everything and there's no bad, there's no evil. God created all the world. We don't believe in a devil in Judaism. Very important to know. We don't believe in Satan, as, as it said. We believe there is an angel that Hashem created with a job to challenge us and to make us stronger. But we don't believe in the, in forces against God. God is everything. God doesn't um, have anything outside of him. There's nothing in this universe that is outside of God. Yet, when we see a concept of Amalek, we see an entity that is determined to destroy us because we remind uh, we remind this Amalek of that there is a God and that we have a responsibility to reveal godliness and everything. And Amalek can't handle that kind of reminder. So Amalek has to destroy this reminder. So the fact that we're still able to, have, to, to be victorious over such an enemy, such a strong enemy that has the chutzpah, that has the 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 unquestionable uh, commitment to this hatred, and we still could win. Ultimately, that shows the greatness of God even further. This is what we read before about vinegar. Let's go straight on to the um, to the final message. So, going back to the to the vinegar being a source of the wine. So when wine tastes like wine, we make a special bracha, right? We make a bracha bara priyagafen. Blessed are you, Hashem, who created the world, who created the grapes that are in the vines and the grapes that produce this wine. What happens when wine becomes vinegar? If, God, if you're not supposed to drink it, but if you do drink it, you would make, you would not make a, um, you would not make a bara priyagafen, you would make a shahakal. Because it's no longer wine, it's now a new, uh, it's now a new entity. It's a different entity. So, so too, when Hashem creates this world, it has the ability to transform itself into something else, as Amalek does, but it still could be conquered and it still could be overcome. How could it be overcome? Here we go. This was Moshe's answer. So Moshe implied all this by saying a cup of wine cannot be compared to a cup of vinegar. Shabbos and Amalek are both cups through which we fill, are filled with the revelation of sacred godliness, because Amalek is also rooted in holiness. However, the two cups are not equal. The Shabbos cup urges us to observe and sanctify, while the Amalek cup urges us to punish. By remembering Shabbos, we reveal Hashem's omnipresence on earth. Remembering Amalek doesn't reveal Hashem's presence on earth. Only when we punish Amalek and crush and obliterate all the movements uh, that aim to rebel against Hashem is Hashem's true omnipresent revealed because we've been able to overcome this, this power. This vinegar is an apt metaphor for Amalek. Why? Because when we obliterate Amalek, the cup of vinegar is revealed as a medium that restores and revitalizes the soul. It becomes useful. It's not just sour wine. It's a whole new entity. It's an entity that could actually be a, have a positive use. This is because remembering. This is because we're remembering to destroy Amalek demonstrates that Amalek's existence derives exclusively from Hashem's unlimited omnipotence. Okay, let's break this down, and I want to go back to the, the to the first slide, to the first verse from our parsha, right over here. So now we started off by saying, "Remember what Amalek did to us during the journey after you left Egypt." Fine, that makes sense. Remember that Amalek tried to attack you. But then it says, erase the memory of Amalek. It doesn't say erase Amalek. Erase the memory of Amalek from beneath the heavens. Do not forget. What does it mean, the memory? So it's one thing to say that we could, we could destroy Amalek and destroy the enemy and be victorious. But that's not enough. 
because what Amalek what Amalek is trying to do, what Amalek's existence is, is not something like we said before. It's not we're not immune to it, and therefore we have to um, um, eradicate the possibility. Eradicate the possibility that it's that it's okay and that there's something that is that exists that will actually win. When is Amalek a problem? When is Amalek so dangerous? Is when we believe that there's actually a possibility that they will win. If we think that the Nazis could win, if we believe for a moment that whatever other anti-Semitic group arises could win, if we believe for a moment that any other type of hatred could eventually win and overtake the world, we have a very big problem. It's going to prevent us from Zachar Sima Shabbos It's going to prevent us from believing that Hashem is the entire world. So it's not just that we have to destroy Amalek. We have to erase the fact or the belief that there's a possibility of Amalek winning. We have to remember that there is an Amalek. That's the first part. But the second part is to remember that we that Amalek can never win. And Amalek only exists to show how strong Hashem is. And to show how united Hashem is. That even with an Amalek in the world, there's still no chance of victory. And that's the most important part. We're going to face anti-Semites. We're going to face bad people. We're going to face bad situations and tough situations. But the moment we make the mistake where we think for a second that this entity or this um, um, negative force has a chance, then we're in real trouble. And that's why this is the only biblical mitzvah, uh, I'm sorry, the only part of the Torah that we're biblically mandated to hear is the remembering to forget Amalek. Because we have to remind ourselves that as bad as we think it could be, it can never win. It never will win. Because ultimately it's just vinegar. It just comes from the same source. And all we have to do is turn it into a lifesaver. Elevate it. Reveal the source and, and, and the negativity falls apart. And this is the most important thing. So the, the lesson that we want to take from this, I can't explain how anti-Semites or how bad people do what they do. Uh, I'm not smart enough to understand that. But what we have here, what we have here from, from the Sikha, from the Stock of the Rebbe, is the confidence that and the, the infusion of confidence, reminding us that no matter as, how bad it gets or how bad we think it might get, that never has a chance to win. And that's the Zachar as as Timcha as Zechar Amalek is to destroy not just Amalek, but destroy the memory of Amalek. That destroy the thought, destroy the thought that there could ever be a victory of Amalek. That is the lesson we take with us. And despite negativity we might see in the world, we have to remember that the victory is always going to belong to us. It's always going to belong to God. And with the coming of Mashiach, we'll be able to see that in a revealed sense. Good job, everyone. Thanks for joining. Excellent.